Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. On this edition of Minnesota Original, Shaka Unkali empowers youth through community mural projects in the Phillips neighborhood of Minneapolis. Unconventional brushes, collected trash, and a malleable canvas are elements in painter Gregory Euclid's work. And performing in St. Paul's Wabasha Street Caves, Chris Cunningham and John Hermanson of the folk duo Story Hill. I fell in your well of sorrow. These artists and more, now on Minnesota Original. doesn't tell a story at beginning, middle, and the end, then it's just images on the wall. To me, the, the very important part to distinguish a mural is for it to have a story. And if the art doesn't stimulate dialogue and discussion, then I feel that we're not doing our, 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 our job. My name is Shaq Kali. I'm also known as I Self Divine. I'm the director of organizing and community building at uh, Hope Community in the south side neighborhood of Phillips. I'm a muralist, musician, father, a man of many hats. The project is called The Power of Vision. Uh, we've been doing it for seven years. The organizations that are involved are Little Earth, White House, and Hope Community, and Main Street Project. The overall goal is to teach process and end result. If you master the process, then you can dictate what the end result is gonna be, as well as being able to tell your story. It was an idea that some of the students had that there was like a stairway to success. One is going up the stairs, one is falling down. When we do our mural, we always have uh, what we call a listening session. We start off with the mural process asking people what's most important to them. It's an opportunity to listen, not to assume. Ask questions, push, challenge. And a lot of times you're talking to people who've not been asked these questions. Something simple is, what do you think? What's most important to you? Do you mind us, uh, you know how you got the house right here? Mm -hmm. Do you mind if we put some of the house kind of over here as well? Okay. Are you cool with that? It's not my story. This isn't my idea. And that's the whole purpose of it. How to, to more of a pop ed style of engaging people to ask them. You don't come in with loaded assumptions. You just say, I don't know what, what's most important. Again, so you're really requiring people to bring their full selves. And really, it's more of also like a safe space. The murals that that we do can be found a majority in the Phillips neighborhood. This mural that we're at right now is on uh, East 29th and 13th Ave. We've also done murals on 13th, right around the corner, uh, New York Plaza. Then we have another mural that's right around the corner on 12th Ave that's on um, St. Vincent's. Um, we have a, a mural on 25th and Chicago. It was a census mural, as well as a service learning project for Peace Jam. We also have a mural on the side of Cedar Cultural Center. That was a, a, a collaboration between Wade House, Hope, and Brian Coyle. And then on top of that, some of the youth that I've worked with also have gone on to do uh, other murals with some of the same partners. So again, it's really an entrepreneurial spirit. So most of the lead facilitators do their own projects based on the skills that they've learned in the program. I hope that the community, you know, feels a sense of pride, feels a sense of ownership. 
A lot of times I say that there's a 90% rate that once we paint on, 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 on the murals that there's no graffiti on there. So these are the things that we talk about, about what's in it for the business owners. It's a win-win for everybody. One of the things I notice, you know, when we do a mural, when it's finally done, is no matter how small the, 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 the part of the mural that youth were part of, they're gonna show and point to their parents and there's so much uh, uh, excitement, so much confidence that you see because they're part of something that's public, that's big, that's large, that's colorful, you know, that they can continue to bring their family and friends to, you know, and then also they've been a part of completing something. As a, as a young artist, I, I started just drawing mostly because uh, that's uh, how you could get attention. And like any psychologist will tell you, if you get attention from doing something, you'll continue to do it. This is where I get my material. Every time it rains, you can find, this is some kind of styrofoam. You'll find it all over here. Times are so If someone hasn't seen my work before, I tend to describe it as landscape painting, maybe contemporary landscape painting. So what I'll do is pick it all up and put it in my pocket and bring it back. Whenever I try to explain it to someone, it ends up getting uh, very long-winded and 
very confusing and they usually just end, I usually just end up saying that's oh, landscape painting. <laughs> it's gotta keep raining, otherwise I'll run out of supplies. Well, I use the styrofoam in my work to kind of symbolize this thing that's man-made but omnipresent in the landscape. So it's not very difficult to find this stuff everywhere you go. So sometimes I'll use the spatula to scrape the paint across the, the surface and let the, let the paint kind of act as, as paint and not appear so representational. I also like the way that it kind of scumbles along the surface. So there's land here, and uh, in, the, in the center of this scene, I'm going to create some type of industry that moves in and kind of starts, is built upon that land. The stuff that's around this is going to be more deliberate and organized because it's a, a city, so city planning is much different than you know, a natural prairie or a forest. I think of it as uh, experience and memory. So when I go out into a forest, I, I walk through the forest and I'm experiencing these vignettes moment by moment. And by vignettes, I mean, there's maybe you walk down a hill and you remember that moment of walking down the hill or you come across a, a pond and then you remember seeing that or spending the time there and then you move on to a new place. And you start to think about the, the ecosystem in, in general. It's just, it's overwhelming. It's impossible for one person to understand what's even going on in one foot of space in the forest and that complexity and that density has always been a part of my work to chase the light because you were born it's like you think that's just a city well no it's uh there used to be oak savanna there and before the oak savanna it used to be hunted by you know dakota and sioux and before that it's like the the history of spaces we often forget about this is nature, like dead nature, and then culture. So you've got coffee cups, styrofoam. It's like, this is the, the perfect blending pot right here. This is like reality, what exists. I've got this type of framework established here, and the water works great because I can go and erase things. So like this area right here, if I spray that up close, you can see that like any paint that was still wet will start to fall away. And you get this uh, pattern of decay, and then having that actually happen on the surface of the painting always seemed interesting. In order to hold them, they need to dry like that. I think about what's represented two-dimensionally and sometimes try to create a complement to it three-dimensionally. This all started by, I, I made some paintings that had two or three sheets of paper on and I would go through and I would rip through them and then I'd start painting the next scene onto that as though it's like a, a moment in time and then you pass through the threshold of that moment into the next stage. The, the paint that dripped down would pool up inside of these like relief areas. I thought, okay, well that relief area then becomes a lake. Well, what, what's gonna happen around a lake? You're gonna get, uh, there's water there, so you're gonna have growth up around the lake. So it seemed like a, a rich place to kind of start putting the relief elements in, just having them, you know, stand there like that because they can't. Because the paper comes out in relief, then the objects can use that as a, a foothold to, uh, to start. It's like on a side of a cliff, any rock that comes out, there's gonna be something that's growing on there, whereas on the cliff face, it's much more rare. When I bring sculptural elements in or like pieces from the land, uh, it, I have a tendency to think about 
modes of representation. So you have an illusionistic space that's painted where people can go in with their mind. You have a space that actually comes out that people can move around with their body. And then you have these uh, like fake kind of uh, uh, model type materials that are produced on there. Um, trees that I make from sedum or like, you know, the architectural type of things. So I started fooling around with various plastic bags. The idea that you can take and make a, a, a form that looks like something natural out of something that's, you know, petroleum-based and completely destructive and have that in this landscape, that's kind of important because the landscape itself seems very picturesque, but you know, these are the things that we use on a daily basis that are the antithesis to this kind of idea. All of these different modes of representation get introduced into the sculptural mix and it's kind of uh, left to the viewer to negotiate what those, how those things blend together. And if I just made beautiful paintings, what I'm trying to get at within the work would be lost. You know, so if I can introduce as much garbage as possible from the land into the work, uh, that kind of reflects on the state of land today, as well as making the painting a little bit more realistic to me. I want it to feel like I'm, I'm present in the land in general, you know, and it contains all of the thoughts that I have. I think that's how I, I want to just keep making it more and more uh, realistic in that sense. Uh, when I look at a landscape painting, I think well, that's like one twelfth of the story. I never really pictured this as part of the artist's life, as far as all the technical stuff. What I do with resin and paper is much more complicated than painting ever was. All the gear that I need and the shop and the, the big, my booth, my chamber, all that stuff, it's like way more complicated, you know, and tons of extra work. I mean, the, the fun part of what I do, which is the collage part, is maybe 25% of the stuff that I have to do to produce these things. When people look at my work, they never know what it is. The first question that people ask is, what is it? And the second question is, how do you make it? You know, so I, because so many people ask me about that, I think my work is very process oriented. And what, how I describe it is, I think it looks a little bit like mosaic or stained glass. I, I'm using fragmented paper from a photographic source, so it ends up looking like an aerial topography sometimes. I think a lot about body systems, like cells. And, uh, and things like even like cancers, like these tiny systems that you, we see like close up photography of now. Um, and then I think of stars and things that are far away that we can't see with our naked eye. There she goes. What I'm working on right now is this piece that's about a little less than halfway, and I, I build it in layers. So right now we're at like the third layer. I'll probably do about 10 layers total. And so um, I'll work either with single pieces of um, magazine paper, or I'll work with multiple. So I have you know a whole bunch of one thing. I'm pretty interested in this lady's lips at the moment. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cut these out and see if I can find a good place to put them. I start off with a basic frame and a mold to hold in the resin, and then I start by building up a layer uh, of paper, of collage materials, and then a layer of resin, and a layer of paper, and a layer of resin, on and on, um, until they get too heavy for me to lift, and then they're done. When someone walks into a room, 
and they, they initially see my work, it's, it's glossy and attractive. So a lot of times people want to come in for a closer look. So they will walk up to it thinking that it's abstract, you know, just like an arrangement of color and shapes. But when they get up close, they realize, oh, that's a little eye or that's a little face or it's a hand or, you know, and then they also are, you know, mesmerized by the depth that appears because you can't necessarily see that from a distance. But once you get up close, you realize that there's multiple layers of the paper and the resin and the paper and the resin. This is what I call the chamber, and I do all my wet work down here. The resin comes in a two-part formula. I mix them together, pour it on to my little pieces here. When I was in grad school, I was getting some critiques about my painting, and it was sort of like it, it was technically good, but not it wasn't saying anything fresh. And that's what I was personally feeling, you know, and so I was a little bit frustrated. So I started to cut up stuff that I had around the studio and, and glue it down. And then eventually one of the sculpture students that was one of my grad student peers was using this resin. So I started to pour the resin over the collage and it, it made some wonderful effects. So that's how I got started. I use a heat gun um, to get out all the bubbles that'll cause the bubbles to rise to the surface. Um, and, then, uh, and then it sits here and after a couple hours, it's, it's hardened up. about the future with this work, I feel like I have so many ideas and so many things I write down. I don't feel like I'll ever get to the end of that. One of the greatest compliments that I can get is when somebody who is, you know, artistic or, you know, dabbles, it get, looks at my work and, and says, oh, I, it just makes me want to get in the studio. I want to make more work. So it's like there's a contagion, like an excitement, you know, in the art. That's a great compliment. I like that a lot.
Well of Sorrow is about a Scandinavian festival called Santa Lucia Day. Among other things, it's a, it's a, a festival celebrating the return of, of light. Uh, well, I started thinking about depression and, you know, specifically depression around the time of like the holidays and stuff like that. And that's a lot of what the song means to me. And, and this is what I really like about a song is that people can, you know, it's a good song when, when there's a multiple meanings and people say, oh, that, you know, that song must be about this or, and then they can. So whenever somebody asks me, you know, what's that song about? I, I always like to hear what they think it's about first. Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.